Not long ago, I was part of a crew composed of mainly NASA and ESA scientists, engineers, and architects in a two week astronaut to Mars simulation study in the high altitude desert of Utah at the Mars Desert Research Station. This facility is dedicated to developing field tactics and protocols for a future human expedition to Mars. And whilst conducting research, field work, and testing hardware in the simulated environment, the crew are also subjected to psychological studies, assessments on crew selection procedures, and even tests to determine the best kind of food for future Mars. This expedition, my role as the crew engineer was to maintain the habitat module systems, the greenhouse systems, the spacesuit systems, and the uh, quad bike all-terrain vehicles, whilst also serving as an extra set of hands for scientific projects and fieldwork. And I, as a lowly first-year PhD student at the time, somehow managing to jump through the hurdles required to get a spot on this particularly highly qualified six-person crew. How did I do it? My advice for those sorts of long-shot applications, as eloquently as possible, French everything with passion. Early next year I will be leading another expedition into this uh, two-week simulation study um, with some UK PhD students and again some NASA and ESA scientists and even a commercial astronaut in training. We will be field testing a telerobotically operated Mars rover, a solar-powered drone built to fly in the tenuous Martian atmosphere, some very clever automated sample collection hardware, even some, some exciting prototype spacesuit technologies. And we'll be conducting a range of field work, from a feasibility study on making rocket fuel from desert soil, to extreme weather testing of a few candidate microorganisms for transforming the Martian environment to something more hospitable for us. My research is into the future of aircraft design. Bio-inspired, morphing, green aircraft. But I'm not going to talk to you about that. I've been asked to talk to you about my views on Mars and the potential it has for humanity. When I started my research, clarifying the motivation for it, I quickly came to realize that we face a problem. It's not something I've thought about really before, it's not something we really do think about day to day, but it is really quite obvious. And that is that the world we live on is finite. The resources we share on it are limited. And Pursuing ways to make aircraft greener by consuming less fuel and emitting less greenhouse gases, I still maintain it's commendable, but it is no long-term solution. It is simply a speed bump to the problem we're facing. If humanity remains locked to this planet, it will eventually collapse. Pushing forward green initiatives, putting in strict regulations, policing the way we use the resources we have will slow that collapse, but don't be fooled into believing it is a solution. If we remain locked to this planet, we will collapse. If we have no intention of leaving this, this nest, we are in effect each other's enemies, fighting for the remaining resources on this planet. War. Organized war is not some human instinct or break away from rationality. It is a highly planned and cooperative form of theft. And as Carl Sagan once said, an organism at war with itself is doomed. Please don't get me wrong. I am not saying humanity is doomed. I think we should be confident that a manned mission to Mars will happen in the coming decades. What I'm saying is, do not go on and assume it will be carried by NASA or ESA rockets, or with 
NASA or ESA astronauts. If we do not take the next step for humanity, it will be simply taken by someone else. But we have not been given any guarantees that the superpowers of the past were not given. As Jacob Bronowski once put it, humanity has a right to change its colors. The Earth is a complete, complex and highly balanced system. And anything we do to it subtracts from that balance, from that order, almost like the law of entropy. We are unique in that we are a shaper of the landscape. We are not locked to it like the rest of the animals. We engineer the environment to our liking. And to survive in this way, we must spread. Or we must devolve back to our pre-Stone Age existence, to living in lockstep with the environment around us. So here we are faced with a critical branch point in our history. Now more than ever, what we do will propagate down through the centuries and powerfully affect the destiny of our descendants. Mars is the next logical step for humanity. The moon to Mars is what Greenland was to North America in the previous age of exploration. The moon simply doesn't have the resources required to sustain a technological civilization. Mars does. We've had the technologies to send people to Mars for decades. And NASA budgeted for a manned mission to Mars and back to set up the architecture around such a system to develop the vehicles and to launch that first mission would cost them approximately 50 billion dollars in today's money with an additional two billion dollars for each subsequent mission but what does that mean what is 50 billion dollars to the US well to give some context 50 billion dollars is two weeks worth of the US defense mission. There have been over a thousand weeks since that draft mission plan was put together. So what is going on? Why has the US not already got Mars base? Looking at this wall we are accelerating towards as a species, it almost seems ridiculous. I've asked more than a dozen astronauts, more than a dozen senior figures at NASA and ESA, and they've all answered with, with one response. Political inertia. There is no will to do it. We are too short-sighted as a species, too selfish, too caught up in trivial things today that are forgotten next week. There will always be more immediate concerns to distract us from what lies further ahead. Disparities will always exist because it is simply in our nature to create them, to move the yardsticks. But we can't allow ourselves to become wholly short-sighted. The right balance must be found between the near term and the long term. And with the world spending seven times more on cosmetics than on its space agencies, I question whether we have the right balance. You know, the Apollo program set on getting American to me inspired a generation. The number of students in the USA, from high school through to PhD, in the subjects of mathematics, in all of the sciences, in engineering, the number of students doubled over the Apollo era. Doubling the scientific literacy of your population when you're living in a world so dependent on science and technology was a very good move and it launched the US into what it is today. You know, the Americans have think tanks working on how they're going to deal with the rise of China. And the Chinese have think tanks working on how they're going to deal with the rapid decline of America. China is rising. The design of the Chinese civilization, of its government, is very different to that of the West. 
and is not going to become like the West. Modernization does not mean westernization, that is an illusion. The power of the Chinese state has been unchallenged for over a thousand years, whereas we in the West tend to view the state power as something that needs to be constrained, the Chinese state has become so embedded into the lives of its people, it almost acts like a paternal figure at the head of every Chinese family. Great things have been achieved and are achievable with this system. There is very little inertia in this paradigm. The Great Wall, the Grand Canal, the Three Gorges Dam are state projects that took a hundred or more years to complete. With the way things are run in the West, with the change in the governmental power every decade at least, such large projects are not achievable. Humanity will go to Mars. It has taken a long time, but the universe has finally become self-aware through us. I feel that we, the consciousness of the universe, must spread this gift of life, of consciousness. We must move forward. We must leap from our nest. I feel it is our obligation to do so.